Coming up on this episode of the IoT Inc. Business Show. And so we, we come to kind of that sweet spot where our engineers feel if we are provided this amount of time, that would be the optimal way to do it, to have full coverage end to end. And then anything after that, you would probably still see value, but it would be diminishing very quickly. So we try and hit right there out of the gate. Uh, obviously, there's budgetary con considerations that come into play. Uh, we very much recognize that at the end of the day, security is not a technology challenge. It's an economic challenge. Black hat, white hat, gray hat. What does it all mean? Well, in this context, the different colored hats refer to different approaches to testing the cybersecurity of your IT, or in our case, IoT infrastructure. In this episode of the IoT Show, I speak with Paul Howdigy about pen testing and other things you need to know about when working with an external security assessment firm. All this and more on this episode of the IoT Inc. Business Show. The people, the business, and the technology of the next generation internet. This is the IoT Inc. Business Show. And now, here's your host, Bruce Sinclair. Hello and welcome to the IoT Inc. Business Show. This show is made possible by sales of my book, IoT Inc., published by McGraw-Hill, and the IoT Inc. Certified IoT Professional, or ICIP, online training and certification program. Become a certified IoT professional by completing the program's three courses, ICIP Technology, ICIP Business, and ICIP Strategy and Digital Transformation. Details of which can be found at www.iot-inc.com. That's www.iot-inc.com. With me today on the IoT Business Show is Paul Howdigy. Paul is a member of Praetorian's founding team, where he's responsible for all aspects of marketing, branding, and communications. His work has been featured in Fortune, Forbes, NBC News, Business Week, and TechCrunch. Tech I met Paul at Internet of Things World, and after a thoughtful discussion on security, I thought I'd invite him on the show. Paul, welcome. Hey, Bruce. Thanks for the invitation. Glad to be here. Yeah, no, uh, it sounds like you've been around a little bit. So what's been, what's new? What, what have you been up to lately? Well, uh, you know, uh, based on our, our conversation over at IoT World, uh, definitely uh, gave you the impression that I've been, uh, you know, dove into the deep end of security, been been yeah. swimming in there for, for the last five, six years now. Um, recently, uh, I, I just got uh, finished with uh, delivering a presentation over at the Design Automation Conference, which was actually hosted here in Austin, Texas this year, oh, which was uh, okay. very convenient for me, just a few blocks Design down. Design Automation Conference. Uh, okay. Yeah. And so it is uh, sponsored by the IEEE and uh, Got it. You know, big focus on embedded systems. And uh, 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 I was part okay. of a, a session uh, that uh, was focused on IoT security specifically. Um, able to talk a little bit about some of the cool projects we're working on over here at Praetorian. And uh, another member of the panel was uh, actually the, the CTO from Cisco. Um, she is focused on um, industrial Internet of Things security. Sure, so sure. Really great. to We, we actually uh, met at the speaker's breakfast in the morning. That they uh, required us to, to come out to at 7 a.m., 7.30 a.m., and mm -hmm. basically got lost in, in deep conversation for about two hours talking about... Uh, the issues around IoT security, it was, it was pretty fascinating to get her perspective. Now, are you also focused on the industrial side or, or where, 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 what's your guys' playground? Yeah, so it's interesting, uh, you know, before really getting into IoT security, as, mm -hmm. we, as we call it, uh, as a company, uh, we, we, we've had a long history of engaging enterprise and uh, venture backed startups, uh, you know, performing uh, more traditional network infrastructure assessments, as okay. well as working with uh, development teams that may be putting out applications, uh, software, basically uh, mm -hmm. doing penetration mm -hmm. testing and security assessments on that front. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. 
Now, we have worked in the past and you know, are continuing to do so, uh, work with, say, ATM manufacturers, kind of it, you know, from chip to code, uh, whether it's medical, connected medical devices, um, and even looking at industrial controls from the context of more looking at it from the IT side of the space, um, basically demonstrating if we can infiltrate, you know, compromise a workstation on the, the IT side, uh, you know, pivot around the network, uh, look for a way to jump over to the industrial control network segments, and mm-hmm. whether that's in a manufacturing or a, you know a oil refinery context, uh, that's that's kind of has been our world in kind of getting exposed to IoT. We really mm-hmm. started calling it and and you know I, I can say marketing it and reaching out and having conversations, uh, calling it IoT security. Uh, that started about two years ago for us. Um, so okay, it's so a while ago then. It, it's it's a little while. I, I'd say this year, uh, actually leading into the, the end of last year is when things really started picking up uh, a lot more on the, the consumer product side. Uh, okay. So we, we've been doing a lot of work with great companies, uh, big brands who are essentially transitioning their organization and their, their standard product into the connected world, whether that be, you know, uh, connected products within, you know, a smart home setting. So uh, connected mm-hmm. ovens or um, washer dryer, uh, you know, various items sure. throughout the household. So more connected products at this point ultimately lead to, uh, you know, uh, laying in that infrastructure and foundation to, to really realize that smart home uh, experience. When we start, well, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what your background is. I guess you've talked a little bit about it, but your background in IoT. Sure. So my background is actually in marketing. Um, that's kind of what, Uh-oh. I, yeah, Uh-oh. what I bring to the table. Um, at least it's not sales. No. Well, I do get to work <laughs> with clients and, and help them through their problems. So I, I have a bit <laughs> I'm of my kidding. You know, I'm kidding. I'm both marketing and sales myself. Okay. Too, but <laughs> but I, I actually started, uh, you know, back in college studying, uh, advertising. Uh, I was really interested in the creative side of it, uh, whether that was putting together, uh, great, you know, uh, ads or, you know, videos mm-hmm. has really appealed to the, the sexy side of advertising. Don um, Draper style. It, yeah, I guess you could kind of go along that way, but a the little carousel. more modern style of that. Uh, okay, yeah. But, uh, you know, at the time I was uh, not really connected, you know, I was young, not really connected uh, to the business side, the business impact of, of what advertising brought to the table. Again, just focused on the creative. And I had a professor who sat me down and, and said, you know, Paul, you could really go study anything and bring so much back to the table. Uh, so whether that be study psychology and, um, you know, understand how to, how people think and how, how to relate to sure. that or, or, you know, research history, study history to see trends, maybe, you know, to understand where we're going based on where we've come from. And so I, I took his advice and transferred out of the advertising department and moved into film. Uh, so I actually finished up my, uh, undergrad degree, uh, with, uh, um, uh, focus on radio, television, and film. Uh, I spent a little bit of, of time working uh, in the film industry uh, here in Austin, Texas, which doesn't pay well at all <laughs> compared to, say, if you were located right, in sure. Los Angeles. And so on the side, I was doing a lot of uh, marketing work, kind of my own consulting work. And uh, uh, one of my roommates in college was actually uh, Nathan Sportsman, who is the founder of, of our company here. Uh, he has a hmm. deep history in, in security. Um, Several patents, published author, you know, has lectured the NSA, you know, worked at several of the major uh, organizations. So uh, he wanted to, he was in the process of pulling together a team of, of like-minded folks, kind of the, the top top 5%, so to speak. And mm-hmm. uh, I was working with him on, on the sidelines, kind of a la carte. He was one of my clients. And it got to the point, um, you know, I, I went back to school and, and got my MBA. So I kind of came full circle and got that business context and just dove right in. And for me, I really wanted to understand the, the uh, you know, with my work with my clients, what that business impact was. And so I, I saw what Nathan was doing with Praetorian, just getting getting it started back in uh, early 2008. Um, kind of got to the point where, you know, I wanted to, so I could provide more value from the inside and get, dive into the deep end of security and, you know, I'm a kind of a Sunday morning political uh, talk show junkie. So uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> there was there was one meet the press. Maybe it was, and the the director of the CIA, Leon Leon Panetta, was was talking about uh, you know the number one uh, risk to to America 
to the United States is, is cybersecurity. And so that really resonated with me. And uh, yeah. I've been kind of jumping full bore ever, you know, jumping right in ever since and soaking it all in. And so um, now, uh, com- coming full circle, talking about IoT, um, you know, I'm, uh, I've taken the reins as the, the IoT business lead here at Praetorian. So I'm working directly with clients understanding their needs and, and even managing uh, projects uh, through to completion. So really taking uh, a, a lot of uh, what I've learned with engaging in the IoT community and, uh, you know, consuming great content such as, you know, the stuff that you put out, frankly, um, which has been uh, a, a great asset to me, um, really trying to understand how we can relate to, to product teams who are, are putting out solutions uh, to to IoT solutions as well as uh, you know deployments within enterprise and uh, so that's kind of where where I sit um, uh, now. Uh, my big focus is is IoT security and, and how we can uh, engage our our partners and our clients to to figure it all out. It, it seems like everyone is is just trying to figure it out, both on the uh, the implementation deployment as well as the service providers along the way. And uh, we certainly. Uh, have uh, been making strides to to help push that understanding forward. All right. Well, well, let's zero in on these engagements a little bit. So, give us a scope. What is it? What is um, what does a security mandate usually look like for you guys? Sure. So, uh, the way I'd answer that is putting it in the context of maybe the driving motivations uh, of our clients. Right. That's really mm-hmm. what it maps back to. And so, conversations typically start. Uh, with a firm like us, and again, we're we're that external uh, security expertise that that organizations will will tap. Uh, what do they call you? What is what is it? That you, what what's your class of firm? So we are a information security assessment and advisory firm. Um, okay. Really, right. at, at the at the heart of it, the cornerstone of our business is is penetration testing, uh, being able to uh, identify risk and prioritize it and provide a a pathway to remediation. Um, so that, that flows a little bit into risk management, uh, and Mm -hmm. just assisting organizations through that. Um, but back to the, the motivations, Mm -hmm. um, typically say if it's, um, uh, an organization who's developing IOT solutions for enterprise, um, maybe it's a, a retail setting that they're, uh, deploying, uh, their solution into or manufacturing, um, uh, kind of a logistical, uh, um, uh, transit and tra- tracking assets. Um, typically, motivations of, of platforms and solutions, uh, kind of connected products, they'll reach out to us because uh, the clients that they're selling into or the prospects typically have uh, security requirements and start asking security questions as they start oh. engaging the sales process, right? And so um, the folks who reach out to us uh, oftentimes uh, are you know trying to enable their own sales into enterprise to be able to satisfy a lot of the requirements of uh, large companies and and other folks who are, are maybe introducing their their IoT solutions into their environment. So these security requirements that you're talking about, it's interesting because. Well, are they general IT security, networking security, and then they're kind of trying to retrofit them into IoT, or have they actually taken the time to create an IoT security to create IoT security requirements? Well, so it's it's a mixture, right? Um, the way we look at IoT uh, from from our side, we take a holistic approach. So everything we mm-hmm. we say say from chip to code. And so that's our, our perspective and the way we look at it. Uh, obviously, the, from the enterprise side of things, if you're selling into the IT side of the house, uh, and maybe it's a solution that's being deployed, and, and maybe it's a smart, you know, uh, facilitating some sort of smart building, um, uh, maybe it's a smart lighting system throughout their, sure. their buildings. Uh, just taking that, for example, um, at the end of the day, they are tying that into their, uh, you know, IT infrastructure, right? It's connected to their network, whether it's, you know, segmented logically sure. or, or not. Uh, it's, a, it's a new asset class that they have to manage and understand. Uh, so that's one thing. So the technology itself, they need assurances that the product is secure, right? Uh, that their data is safe, that there is no way that uh, folks from the outside can use it as a, a beachhead into the network to either compromise other systems or launch attacks or 
compromise those assets alone. I think from the okay. technology side of it, uh, from a vulnerability identification, is one one part of it. The other part is really the vendors' policies themselves, right? I think a really good example of that, uh, especially if they're going to be managing the data, um, if they they have their own cloud solution and maybe they're providing analytic services or some sort of management uh, interface on top of that, uh, the actual hardware and kind of network layer stuff, um, mm-hmm. the organization needs assurances that, that those have been built in a secure manner. Um, Which organization are you referring to? So let's just say it's uh, a Fortune 500 company who's uh, talking with a, a provider uh, of a, a platform to enable building mm-hmm. building automation. Um, okay. So you know, knowing uh, where their employees are to enable features and services to you know understand proximity and you know uh, know who's in what part of the building to to be able to. to um, provide value in some way, whether that's smart lighting or uh, whatever it may be throughout the building. Sure. Um, sure. So making sure that the actual technology itself is built in a secure way and managed in a secure way. Uh, the other part of it is the, the policies of the the company that would be selling into. I think that's a big thing. And one of the lessons learned is if we take a step back and look at uh, the, the big target breach, uh, again, I'm not you know, mm-hmm. bringing this up as in an effort to, you know, <laughs> spread more. Fear monger. Exactly. Yeah. But more, more in an effort to, to illustrate a, a point with a public example that everyone is aware of for the most part. So the way that, uh, the, the folks got in was through a third party vendor, uh, that was basically responsible for managing targets, HVAC system remotely. So this third-party vendor had legitimate uh, access uh, to the network and was able to monitor and, and control these, these systems remotely. Um, so if you want to kind of equate that to IoT and, you know, there's some OT uh, systems sure. involved there and third-party management providing value and services, if we want to call that an IT solution or IoT solution, we, we can, I think it's fair to maybe yeah, have it yeah. in that mm-hmm. context. And so under that, uh, you know, the way that uh, the bad guys got in was they compromised that third party vendor and leveraged that uh, that level of access to infiltrate Target's uh, data center and ultimately exfiltrate, uh, you know, customer data, credit card information. And, you know, everyone's, uh, I think, aware of the the blowback from that. And so that. That's a really great example, and I think it's a big wake-up call. Um, you know, there was there was implications at the top when it came to Target. Uh, you know, some C-level folks got got hit pretty hard, mm-hmm. and so it's it's a wake-up call. Um, it's important that these organizations are vetting the, the partners they bring in. I think in a connected world, uh, as everything starts becoming connected, uh, it's very important. It, and that kind of maps to a, a shared responsibility model and being able to to vet. Uh, uh, do the due diligence up front to, to understand the risk associated with, with those partnerships. What do you mean a shared responsibility model? Well, it's, uh, it's something I've, I've been thinking about. There's nothing really, uh, from what I know, uh, tied down or it's not a framework I'm, I'm looking to, to walk through here, but, um, it, it, one of the best ways for me to to kind of explain it is kind of in a in a story that I heard from uh, I was having a conversation with the the CISO of GE Lighting. Uh, as you know, you know this is in the public. Uh, they they're they're working with smart cities and trying to understand how to deploy smart lighting solutions in say uh, across a, a smart city context and other services uh, that, and value that would come around that. And so this, this is a guy and he was telling me that, uh, you know, he, uh, people always come up to him or have come up to him and ask him, uh, uh, you know, what's that one thing that keeps you up at night? Right. He, he's, mm-hmm. he's charged with, uh, you know, uh, security and, and that's his, his mission. And his response is, was always been, this is what he told me. His, his response was always, you know, well, nothing, heck nothing. Uh, this is, uh, uh, a guy who, uh, you know, is former military, uh, he was a police officer. And so he's really seen the worst of the worst, right? So he, uh, you know, relative to, to what he's experienced, uh, you know, 
he's he's in a good position to to address those those risks and nothing really keeps him up at night but he mentioned IoT thinking about IoT is really something that that's starting to uh to get his attention and it might soon be that one thing that keeps him up at night because in a connected world say in a smart city context um you know if there's a there's an attack at a parking meter right if there's a breach that traverses the network uh going mm-hmm. up through you know kind of a, a, a a parking infrastructure and, you know, crosses networks and traverses across the networks to affect backend systems and, and other connected systems that, you know, how do you, how do you know what assets you're responsible for? How do, how do you know what you need to respond to? Um, what's the responsibility of, of the city and the folks who are deploying these, you know, how, how would a company like GE lighting, um, you know, uh, contractually navigate that, that responsibility, um, it's really interesting. And then even down to the, the value chain of, of the actual devices themselves that are deployed, right, from, from the embedded systems the, at the hardware level, the chips, the right. chip manufacturers, up to, you know, the developers uh, doing the software, managing the back-end cloud services and infrastructure. I mean, there's just so many connected pieces uh, in a connected world that uh, really need to figure out a way to, to delineate and kind of weld well-defined uh, either contractually or, or just have a well-understood understanding of who is responsible for what. And I think uh, when industry moved to adopt cloud technologies and, you know, enterprise took their time, um, you know, they held on to their data and for a long time wouldn't want to put it in the cloud. I think now we're in a time where it's, it's totally changed. Uh, the clients we deal with are, are the top of the top and, they're all in either Amazon or Azure or whatever it may be, Google mm-hmm. Compute. And, uh, you know, that there's a shared responsibility model that is mapped out that, you know, is well-defined within, you know, kind of an infrastructure-as-a-service model or a platform-as-a-service model or a software-as-a-service model. Um, there's a, a well-defined understanding of what the, the customer is responsible for and what the platform provider is responsible for. Um, so I think IoT definitely needs some sort of framework uh, and understanding uh, to get security to to a good state as more and more stuff comes online. Yeah, there's certainly a few more moving parts compared to a cloud type application or a deployment, and cloud is is one of them. But you know, you get me thinking is that I would think that it's going to be at least initially, and maybe it'll be worked down from there. But I would think it'd be the system integrator that would share or that would have the first round of responsibility. Does that make sense? I think you're right, um, at least from a ongoing support and management. Um, I know I would put that in my contract. That's for Exactly. Sure. And I think it's going to map back to these contractual agreements and uh, the integrators and the folks who are managing these deployments and, and overseeing it over time and providing support have to be that, that front line. Yeah. And then trickle down from there, you know, those guys need to have a clear understanding of what sort of technologies they're, they're working with and assurances that those producers, whether it's at the chip level or, you know, if they're having third party firms develop software or adopting, you know, third party, you know, IoT enablement platforms to, to enable them to integrate these services they have mm-hmm. to they have to vet those thoroughly too so it's it's definitely a trickle down and there's there's a choke point right there um at the integrators i i do agree with you um and uh you know these devices are are going to be put out in the field to to operate for 10 15 plus years um so there there needs to be some sort of ongoing uh stewardship of those uh in terms of security over time to patch them uh stay on top of things yeah, yeah, and I think that'll evolve. But l- l- let's go back to the mandate question. I want to get a little bit more specific. Um, so, your mandates—I mean, are they pen testing, ma- penetration testing mandates, or uh, first of all, what do they look like? What, what, what is it, or is there a typical? Or maybe you can just talk about your typical customer. But what, what do these mandates look like when they engage you guys? Yeah. So. Uh... Definitely. So back to the motivations, uh, definitely our core business is on the penetration testing side. And so uh, organizations will come to us with those specific needs, uh, whether they call it, uh, you know, an end to end IOT pen test or a security assessment or whatever 
uh, language they use, it, it kind of maps back to an assessment of risk within the product or, or uh, system. Um, and so I, I gave you a little uh, insight into maybe in a B2B context, the, the mandate typically comes from the, mm-hmm. uh, the, the organization they may be selling into, right? So they have some gating functions that are mapped to security that they have to check the box through and provide assurances. One of those is penetration testing often. And so they would engage us to conduct the penetration test on, say, a more consumer-facing uh, IoT solution, right? I mentioned uh, smart ovens, uh, mm-hmm. I believe, in one of our conversations, smart dishwashers, uh, so on and so on, anything in, in the connected home. Um, a lot of organizations, and these are you know big enterprises, big brands uh, that maybe have a hundred year history uh, of selling these appliances and, and uh, maybe it's eight, an HVAC system within the home. Um, as those start to kind of uh, migrate into the connected world and you know you're seeing Wi-Fi uh, communication modules put in there, they're starting to connect to the to the home local area network and then connecting back to back end systems to provide more value and services. Those companies have a huge. Um, uh, they are motivated by the more reputational risk uh, that's associated with uh, deploying right. their devices. Um, they have a, a, a you know typically huge brand, um, and as they move into this connected world, it's new. They need to be provided assurances that they are are entering into that new world uh, safely, and uh, you, you know their brand will be well protected as they make steps uh, forward. And so, will you guys ever assure that? Well, so the assurances we provide. Um, so I guess that would kind of take a few steps into the process here of say a penetration test, and mm-hmm. the the goal of the penetration test is really to. Um, demonstrate real world risk to identify vulnerabilities, uh, prioritize those risks Mm -hmm. and then uh, deliver recommendations on how they can, uh, you know, map out their remediation plan following. Um, So uh, there could be uh, two approaches, say, if we if we take one of those uh, consumer product facing companies, um, if they if their questions they're looking to answer were more wrapped around, hey, we, we just want to stay out of the headlines. That's our motivation. That's our mandate. We cannot have yeah. a breach or some incident that... Like Target. Throw, yeah. yeah, like Target. Um, and there's, there's other companies, uh, you know, more on the IT, IoT side that are putting out products that have found their way into the news for negative, uh, you know, reasons. And so that, that's basically an internal mandate that uh, we need to do due diligence to have a firm understanding of the risks um, that map back to our business from a reputational standpoint. And so penetration testing um, can be conducted in a black box setting or mm-hmm. a, a, a more white box uh, right. approach, right? And right. so... W- and in, which do you nor- And can you explain the two of them and then which one do you normally do? Yeah. And so black box is essentially a, a zero knowledge uh, based right. demonstration of risk, right? So... Uh, our engineers, uh, as they enter into it, are not provided uh, anything beyond uh, just typical access that a, a normal user would have, right? Uh, so they have the device. Maybe it's uh, the understanding that they've, they've purchased it and they have a user account. Uh, so what, what could someone, some malicious actor do with that level of access, right? Could they, what, what would happen if they tear down the device, you know, desolder the flash memory, Mm-hmm. Um, you know, dump the firmware and secrets bit by bit, you know, reverse engineer the firmware, identify backdoors and logical flaws that would impact, you know, a wide uh, deployment of these devices out in the field. Uh, and so in a black box, really the motivation in that context is to understand, okay, we just, we, we're either about to ship out our products or maybe we have, uh, you know, kind of a set of them out in the field and we're looking to scale up. I need assurances and understanding that, you know, how much time is it going to take for someone to do some real damage uh, to those out in the field? What, okay. what level, level of sophistication would be required to execute uh, that level of attack uh, and have mm-hmm. that? And what is the impact to our business potentially? And so sure. in a black box setting, 
uh, typically the way we would approach it is to, uh, you know, uh, at least have some understanding of the, the architecture, you know, what components go into it. Uh, we'd probably, but wait a second, isn't that a white box then? Well, so we would, we would do that, uh, you know, with publicly available information, right? Ah, okay. And okay. so, you know, the, the, the FCC, if it's, uh, uh you know, uh, doing any sort of wireless communication, uh, mm. There would be FCC records. Uh, we could actually, without even tearing open the device, we could go pull up uh, photos of the onboard electronics. We could interesting. We could take mm. a look at those. Uh, maybe try and identify. That's all available. I did not know that. Yep, mm. it's all available. Uh, and this is part of the process. This is actually, um, you know, what we're doing is demonstrating uh, real world risk, and this is how sure. how it happens. Uh, out yeah. in the environment, um, and so there's a there's a discovery phase and a reconnaissance phase of any sort of penetration test, and that's that's the same if you're doing an internal network assessment uh, or you know a product connected product assessment. Um, so the FCC would have photos of that. Uh, what what folks would be looking for is maybe identifying the chipsets that that are embedded. Sure. Um, sure. They'd want to have an understanding of those. Maybe go to that manufacturer, pull down the documentation. Um, start to educate themselves on on that. Uh, maybe identify debugging pens or pads that may be present. Mm-hmm. So you are, and that's identified too. Well, it, you can you can infer. Or you they, can deduce it, maybe right. Yeah. Right, and so before you, you break open the device, uh, this is part of the process. Uh, obviously, you'd want to go in and verify manually and tap in and tie into either mm-hmm. J, JTAG mm-hmm. or or UART to sure. have some sort of connectivity and and feedback from the actual embedded device itself. Um, but yeah, that's, that's all part of the process. And so it's about doing that reconnaissance to have an understanding of the size and scope of, of the product you're assessing and then really, uh, time box it, right? Um, does the organization want to allow us to spend three weeks, five weeks, uh, right. maybe with, uh, an engineer or two dedicated to, to seeing what can be accomplished within that, that clear time, time window. Um, those are, those are the kind of things on the black box side, you know, that, okay. an, that answers those questions for them. Yeah. 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 Take us to the white box now. So white box is, uh, you know, for us, our preferred method, uh, I think it provides the most value. More efficient. Yeah. It, it's extremely efficient. And so what that looks like from a logistics standpoint is full access, right? So we get access to the source code. Uh, yep. you know, we get access to architectural diagrams, uh, very, very deep access. It's essentially, we are an extension of their internal team. We, we see everything, right? And so what we're able to do is, uh, you know, through the penetration test, it's code assisted. And so whether that's looking at the firmware um, or, you know, backend web services, looking through code and conducting our, our pen test uh, in kind of a, a more dynamic way, uh, as well as kind of static, uh, verifying stuff at code level, um, it enables us to expedite various test cases, right? So if we're yep. maybe looking into an authorization bypass flaw and we suspect that something's there, we can go very quickly and look at code and say, okay, yes, that's there. It, it's present. We know how to give you a recommendation on how to address that. And we will tell you how to do that at code level. So it not only makes our job more efficient, but it provides remediation, you know, expediency as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and then uh, that the other way in a black box approach, if, if it was a similar test case, we would have to essentially just keep hitting it and fuzz yeah, yeah. it, fuzz it, and then finally figure out, okay, that that's how you break it. Um, so that does take a lot longer. Um, so white box definitely provides a lot more value. Um, we we operate best and deliver the most value when we're seen as as an extension of of the internal team uh, that brings that deep security expertise. Yeah, no, and that matches my experience as well. And and sometimes what I recommend is both. And so, but I put a much smaller window where you do a black box for say two days. And I'm telling you, if people are motivated more than two days. Okay, that says something else. Yep. And then white box it, you know, um, again within within some scope. Um, so let, let's talk about that scope. Can you give us some ideas again in terms of budgets? And that could be dollars. That could be time. What are we looking at to do? I mean, well, I guess you. I guess well, I guess for both, but but it depends on how you do it. But yeah, what are we looking at? What are we looking at in terms of generally what what companies are spending with you time and dollars? If you can share that type of information, sure. So 
the way we typically our typical IoT engagement, uh, secure, you know, uh, I mentioned earlier that we we look at IoT security holistically. We like to call mm-hmm. it from from chip to code. And so, mm-hmm. if if there was a, a product uh, that was brought in, um, say for the smart home, uh, there would be several components involved, right? Uh, we've got the embedded embedded systems, the firmware, yep. the wireless communication protocols. Uh, the various applications, whether they be web interfaces or, or mobile applications, often the t- often time in kind of a, a residential setting, uh, any mm-hmm. third party integrations, uh, and then the back end inf- infrastructure and, and cloud services, and so that that kind of looks at it from from start to finish. And so what we do is uh, when we enter into kind of that first discovery call with with customers. Uh, we start obviously understanding their motivations, right? We, we talked yeah. about some of those. And so based on mm-hmm. those motivations, we would uh, tailor a plan and a, an approach that would, you know, satisfy what they're looking to, to do. And so let's take, for example, kind of at the, the, the bigger initiative, uh, say it was an end-to-end uh, IoT assessment. Uh, so that would involve all the components, uh, maybe looking at them, individually and then also in concert uh, so you can understand the interplay between them and various sure. trust relationships right. throughout. Yep. Yep. Important. Um, very important. Yep. And so uh, what we would do is, is typically take a look at the architecture, have an understanding of those various components and what would be in scope. Uh, and then we would uh, prior, prioritize those and, and lay out a, a schedule around those. And so typically what what we're we're seeing, say, if we we're conducting both a black box and a white box, and we do do mm-hmm. that um, okay. within maybe kind of a phased approach, starting with the black box, um, yeah. maybe uh, you know depending on the size and complexity of the product and the environment we're looking at, on the low ends, like you said, uh, we could take maybe a week or two on maybe a more complex system. Um, maybe we'd want to get up to to three uh, three weeks for for a black box portion of that assessment. And then slowly we would start phasing into white boxes. They start passing us, uh, information. Uh, so we would already come to the table of the white box, uh, phase with a, a certain level of understanding and then be able to, to really maximize our efforts. So we might take another, uh, two, three weeks for the white box, depending on the number of components that we'd be looking at. Uh, so all in all, if, if you're looking at an end to end IOT assessment, um, in terms of time, um, it, you know, anywhere between, uh, you know, two, two to five weeks, if there's multiple products and it's a complex environment, and maybe you're, you're servicing, uh, you know, multiple regions around the world with various backends, right? So maybe mm-hmm. North, North America, South America, Latin America, you know, um, uh, Europe and Asia, um, you know, there could be a lot at play. And if everything's in scope, Naturally, it would take it would take more uh, more time and attention. Okay, and so roughly two to five weeks, and then I'm guessing you know there has to be some uh, um, there has to be some correlation with the size of the organization as well, because that's going to be related to the risk. So, you know, for example, I mean, I'm going to ask you in a minute, you know, what this is all going to cost. But for example, with a startup you know, they've, they have a budget and they can, you know, they're probably going to be on the closer to the two week side only because the risk associated with it is going to be a lot less than the risk associated with a, with a fortune 500 company or fortune 50 company. So I, I guess that's my first question. I, I would imagine the answer is yes, but, but are you seeing it also correlated this two to five weeks on the barometer of company size? Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, and how we address that uh, initially, our our preliminary proposal and how we position our approach is is, you know, based on time and level of mm-hmm. effort, right? And so we we come to kind of that sweet spot where our engineers feel if we are provided this amount of time, um, that would be the optimal way to do it to have full right. coverage end to end, and then anything after that, you would probably still see value, but it would be diminishing very quickly. Sure. Sure. Um, so we try and hit right there out of the gate. Uh, obviously there's budgetary con- considerations that come into play. Uh, we very much recognize that, uh, you know, security is, is not at the end of the day, security is not a technology challenge. It's an economic challenge. Uh, and yeah, so this, well said. 
Yeah. And so this definitely speaks to that. And so um, if an organization uh, maybe is earlier on in, in their life cycle uh, and they, they have other priorities uh, for their business, uh, but security is still very important. Uh, what we do is then prioritize and maybe map back to their budget. So that that could be rolling back scope a little bit. And maybe there's some components that might not be as high risk that we would say, you know what, these areas might take a lot of time to look at. But if we were to prioritize it based sure. on the time window that you would allow us to conduct uh, our work, we really should focus in on these areas and really be guided by uh our perceived level of risk within the, the, the environment or product. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so there's a couple, you know, there's a couple points that come up here. Number one, unfortunately, people don't want to spend money on security. And the reason they don't want to spend money on security, because right now, notwithstanding what you brought up earlier in terms of certain um, um, requirements, security requirements, but notwithstanding those issues, people generally are really wanting to have the new bells and whistles before they have the security. So you've got that challenge, and then and then the the second challenge one is is looking at it from the wrong way. And you've brought this up a few times. I brought it up, and looking at it, the business the business counterpart to security is risk management. And so understanding what is the total risk, and that's what I was saying earlier. A startup they go bankrupt. It's going to be, let's say, there's a $10 million risk because that's how much money they put into the company. So obviously, you're you're not necessarily that. That's a pretty much the top end. So you're not going to spend. Um, you know, that's your maximum risk. So you're going to look and see, okay, what do I need to do to mitigate that? A larger company, the risk is going to be higher. And then you need to go through, and this is the risk assessment process that you've alluded to. You need to go through each part of the architecture. Um, whether that is kind of feeling your your way, like feeling for the elephant in the black box or in the white box, but you know these are the two the the two aspects. One, product managers are wanting to get features out and spend money on features, and and number two, um, sometimes this is done the wrong way, you know, and it's not it's not being driven by business. But it seems like you guys are looking at it from a risk point of view, not necessarily from a security point of view, and there is a difference, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we, we, we do at the end of the day consider ourselves uh, a team of engineers, uh, but we, we bring that business acumen to the table, right? So in terms of risk, um, you know, you've said it on your show before, it's very well understood in the security community, but essentially risk get, gets mapped to, you know, the cost of a potential breach, right? Yep. Multiplied by the likelihood that that That's event right. would recur, occur. Um, now what's interesting about that, and you're right, uh, you know, a security or excuse me, uh, a, an IOT startup, if they put $10 million into it and they're pushing forward with it and they, uh, you know, deployed uh, their product out in the field and there was an irreversible change that they could not address. And there was complete brand, uh, and reputation damage, uh, going out of business situation. Not, mm -hmm. not to say that there is, but this is a hypothetical, um, you know, $10 million, that, that was their loss, right? Um, at the end of the day, all security spend should be to mitigate a loss to the business. Right. And, absolutely. you know, if we go back to the Target uh, example, again, just a, a well-known one, the Target CEO was, or CIO was, was very, uh, I believe he was quoted uh, saying that, you know, he's not willing to, to spend $10 million dollars in security to avoid a $1 million loss. Right. Mm -hmm. And Makes so, sense. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that, that statement is completely true and that's, that's the right approach. The only problem with that was that he got his risk formula wrong. Mm -hmm. okay? So he didn't correctly understand the true cost of, of that level of breach the, and the he, reputational cost. Right. Um, and so, you know, it, it it's an interesting uh, point. You know, there's a very simple formula: risk e equals cost of breach times likelihood. But <laughs> the and it's an art. <laughs> how you ar arrive at those variables yeah, is very true. complex and and very much uh, you know uh, difficult to do sometimes. Yeah, and I would even go, you know, having been in these type of meetings, I would even go beyond that and say, yes, it's complex, but at the end of the day, it's an art. And it, it really comes down to a lot of times experience and gut level decisions and, you know, just putting your finger up in the air. And, and so people can't get grinded down 
in the analysis paralysis on on this you know on this process. But yeah, you bring up a great point. You bring up a, a that's an that's an excellent example with Target in terms of yeah maybe the hard loss was a million, but the reputational loss could have been. I don't know, you know, a hundred million, you know, something like that. So, okay. So we have that. We, I think we're, I think we're painting this picture pretty clearly. What, what's the cost per week generally for an organization like yours? So what do we, what are our listeners having to think about for budgeting? Because, you know, they're, you, you want them to come to you with the right budget, right? Yeah. So, you know, we, we operate kind of a very simple formula. Um, you know, I'm happy to share that with your, your audience um, so we put when we put out statements of work and proposal in the scope of work, everything is documented and mapped back to hours and and okay. it's it's fixed bid essentially, and Got so uh, that maps back to for us it's it's a rate of two fifty an hour. Um, mm-hmm. So for a security engineer to be performing uh, the, the activities uh, that he or she may be conducting uh, for any given week, it would be you know. 40 hours, let's say, at 250 mm-hmm. an hour, so about 10,000 a week. Okay. So you can map that up to some of the the, the weeks, um, yeah, you know that yeah. that we talked about there, and kind of arrive at at uh, where where we're sitting for a typical engagement. No, and listen, you know, I have no, uh, I'm actually not connected to any security company. I do use I do use them, but that's that's about right. Um, yep. And we're talking. You know, we're talking 10k a week, and you know, just looking at your at your numbers, 20 to 50k. Listen, that is so worth it. It is so worth it. With, you know, <laughs> the caveat of, you know, I'm assuming though, you know, that you've got more to lose, you know, than you know, than the than the 20k or the uh, the 50k, which I would I would assume that would be right. So, in my view, in my recommendation, it's money well spent, um, specifically because going externally because specifically because we just don't have that talent internally. I've not been to any organization, any of my clients where we've got some smart guys, but they might be smart networking guys. They might be smart web interface guys. They might be smart cloud guys. They might be smart app guys. But and even but but then even what you brought in the system issue, you know, this interdependency between each of these uh, security systems, it, it's just tough to find the right people. And so, you know, if we're talking about 20 to 50k this is so worth it, and and um, I don't know, I, I don't know how many times I need to say it, but it's really good that you that you're explicit, Paul, and I really appreciate that because um, it just gives it just gives our listeners uh, an idea of, of of budget, and and again, it has to be spent wisely, and you want to prioritize that budget within whatever you can, but for you know, let's say even twenty k, I think most startups, and specifically the officers of those startups, because they have risk associated with themselves being on, you know, being an officer of the company, I see that as a no-brainer. But it's so surprising, you know, it's so surprising where you know I've talked to people and they've they've been dealing with companies. They say, is there a way that we can actually just not have any security at all? <laughs> you know, completely eliminate it, and it's just mind-boggling to me. But um, anyway, enough of the rah-rah on this one. It, I think you brought up a few good points. Now I want to think about in terms of in terms of getting the most out of it. So for our listeners who are now going to engage um, with a security assessment firm, um, pen testing generally being a big part of it, how should they prepare so that they're most efficient when working with you? Um, there's I think that's good for you, and it's certainly good for them to not burn through your hours. but what what should they be doing? What th- should they be doing in advance of selecting a firm? Sure. Um, and I'll, I'll roll into that answer, but I wanted to throw out a quick point to to the last uh, topic we were talking about. and uh, yep. that is uh, you know the real problem at the end of the day is not any individual set of uh, vulnerabilities, right? it's It's rather a, a lack of security consciousness. In the field, right? Uh, so, you, you know, product managers, engineers, uh, developers, and even testers rarely come to the table with that deep security knowledge or skill set. Just like you mentioned, it's very, you know, that that uh, technical expertise that's dedicated to various uh, core disciplines within uh, security. Uh, and there's there's quite a few. Um, they rarely come to the table with that expertise, and even if they do, things evolve so rapidly that it's very difficult for people to keep pace. Uh, mm, mm, and so mm. that, that is really where, where we provide the value. Uh, it's being that extension of your internal teams yep. that provides that expertise, 
when up to date expertise. Yeah, yeah. when mm -hmm. needed. And we have the visibility of, of seeing it across a wide set of various industries and other folks who are dealing with similar challenges. And so, um, yeah, for those reasons, uh, you know, I just wanted to throw those out as well. Um, appreciate you, you, you talking about uh, the advantages of bringing in that outside expertise. And it's a no brainer. That, yeah. yeah. And so leading into what, what organizations could do once they understand that there is value and it's something uh, that needs to be done, activities that need to be conducted, um, you know, they, uh, they need to uh, help. Essentially, they need to understand what the immediate uh, questions they're trying to answer are or what the immediate hurdle they're uh, from a business mm -hmm. side. They like their to. motivations you were talking about. Exactly. Right? So have a firm understanding of your motivations and what you're looking to accomplish. It's very, uh, you're not going to find as much success if you come in without that firm understanding. And if you don't have that firm understanding, you know, seek to find that before you engage a firm like us or engage us and we can walk through that uh, conversation together. Um, but is this uh, to enable your sales into enterprise? Is it to help uh, you know, shorten your sales cycle and overcome a lot of those uh, requirements that your customers mm. are asking of you. Okay. With that said, let's seek, let's seek to address that first. Let's address the, the immediate issues that are in front of mm. you and then work out to build out a more mature uh, approach the way that, uh, um, you know, the product teams and, and organization is approaching security over time. Um, and so understanding what what you're looking to accomplish out of the gate is very important. I'd say the next next thing that is important is to understand uh, you need to have uh, you need to plan for remediation. If you if you're unable to allocate uh, resources or your development cycles to addressing these issues, you know there's no value in conducting it. Right? You're you're understanding the risk. You're identifying it. We're helping you to prioritize that risk. But if you're not in a position to address it. Um, you know, wait until you are. Uh, so that yeah, would be good advice. Good advice. Good advice. That would be uh, another recommendation. So, with that said, if that involves third-party partners, uh, oftentimes in kind of an IoT uh, setting, uh, you're you're having to to work with third parties, whether it's developing the mobile app component or maybe it's an IoT enablement platform that's enabling you to you know get your proof of concept and test the market early before you jump up and scale. Um, mm -hmm. rope them in too. bring them in, uh, Absolutely. because their, their technology and their platform and their software and their development teams, um, need to, to have a, a voice at the table, um, especially in this white box context context, they need to be able to provide, uh, code. And oftentimes, uh, you know, if, if an organization has enough leverage because of their size and, in, uh, over an IOT enablement platform, Say it's a Fortune 500 uh, mm -hmm. consumer-facing product company, and they're using uh, you know an IoT enablement platform in their you know communication modules and their their backend cloud infrastructure, and go down the line. Um, oftentimes, that that big company is going to have some leverage because you know that's the big logo that they're shining on the front of their website, and that's their you know probably makes up a majority right. of their business, right. and so. Right. That leverage, uh, use that leverage, make sure you work in your, your partners, bring them to the table, because uh, at the end of the day, they are going to be the ones that are, are going to be needing to be involved in remediation as well. No, that's great advice, Paul. And I guess the only thing I'd add, and maybe you kind of were alluding to that, or maybe you explicitly said it, but um, also know what you have. And so from a security point of view, um, be prepared. So the tech team has to be prepared with an architecture. They have to be prepared with what other security, whatever security they work they've done. You want to prep that, right? I mean, you know, they need going to need that information. I think it's a great idea in terms of the budget, making sure that you can then execute on it. There's no sense because things are going to change also, not only right. in the world, but it's also going to change internally. They're going to change their code. The only the only thing is you know that that I that I'm concerned about and it makes a lot of sense to use the application enablement platforms and and I like where you're going with that um, yeah yeah I think it's a, it's a topic for another show to see how far they'll open up the kimono but just the issue of security by design is something that needs to be done from the very beginning and so it's you know when you engage uh, if you engage too late. 
there could be issues too. And so this is a bit of a balancing act. And, and so I would also recommend, and maybe you've got a different perspective on this, but if you don't have that really solid IoT experience, you might want to get these guys, you know, uh, you might want to get them for a, a week or maybe even a couple of days to make sure that your initial architecture is making sense from a security by design architecture point of view. Do you have anything to add to that, Paul? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, first, companies need to be implementing security by design. And that, you know, that's what yes. you're, you're getting at. Um, they should, uh, you know, build it into their... It's hard to retrofit it. Yes. Well, it, it's much more expensive. And yes, it is. It takes a lot more resources to do so. Um, they really need to be baking it into the product and solutions from the outset rather than an afterthought. Uh, I think for the most part, development or product connected product teams um, are uh, good about going through the motions in terms of uh, establishing a set of security requirements throughout the the research and development process. Uh, I think they are. The only disconnect mm -hmm. there is you can't have a line item and said, okay, I need encryption between communication between my mobile device and my back-end cloud system, right? At the end of the day, yes, that is a security requirement, but how are you going to implement that? And how, you know, after the product is built, we would come in to verify that that, verify mm -hmm. the implementation matches those business requirements for security. Um, and so you're right, bringing outside security expertise in early in the design phase to either conduct threat modeling exercises to understand kind of various attack vectors that, that maybe your teams are not mm -hmm. thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, and how you and ensure you're following best practices. Right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. And so, you know, why you would do that, it's to save money over the course of the Absolutely. lifetime, right? Because it's, it's right. as you mentioned, if we come in for a couple of days or maybe a week, conduct, you know, more of, uh, you know, looking at the architectural plans, uh, what sort of technologies you're looking to implement, how are you doing encryption, why are you doing this that way, and, and start starting to talk about risk and addressing risk early. Uh, it's very easy to move around a diagram on a page and, you know, change some words rather than re-implement something. And so... Recoding it like, yeah, exactly. a year later or six months later. Right. Yeah. Excellent advice, Paul. Where can people where can people find out more about your, uh, you and your organization? Yeah, so you know the easiest way to find Praetorian is just searching Google for IoT security testing. We usually mm. yeah we usually come up at the top there. Uh, you can visit Praetorian dot com. Um, I'm sure you'll have I'll put that, that in the show notes. The show yeah. notes, yeah. It's it's. Uh, I don't know how to spell it, but I think I could get there. Yeah. Yep. And uh, we're also, uh, you know, LinkedIn, Twitter. Uh, Twitter is at Praetorian Labs. Uh, okay. I can also be found on, on Twitter and, and LinkedIn as well. Uh, one thing that, that I've done uh, in the past, you know, I, I'm definitely a big fan of your show and have listened to, to all the content through the podcast is I've actually gone out and, and reached out and just, you know, to your guest and, and said, hey, I, I nice. really enjoyed your nice. perspective there. I heard you on Bruce's podcast. And you know, it's it's great to, to start up that that dialogue, um, and uh, it's all about just continuing the conversation. And you know, definitely recommend if anyone's interested to reach out and just talk about IoT. Uh, I'm definitely one to nerd out on it, so I always enjoy it. No, that's a great recommendation in terms of connections, and I've heard that from different uh, different listeners as well, where they've yeah they reached out and and you just said it. You're you're more than welcome to you know have these discussions and. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your insights, and we'll be talking soon. All right, Bruce. Thanks so much. I've enjoyed it. Okay. That was a good talk with Paul Jargwe. This podcast goes vertical, deep diving into different topics each week. If you prefer a more horizontal and structured approach to learning IoT business and its orbiting technologies, check out my book, IoT Inc., published by McGraw-Hill, or become a certified IoT professional by completing the ICIP training and certification program. For details, just go to www.iot-inc.com. Also go to www.iot-inc.com for an analysis of this episode, links to things that were mentioned during the episode, and very importantly, the episode's PDF transcript. Just search for the name of the episode or the guest. If you're new to this podcast, subscribe. 
That way you'll get every week's episode delivered straight to your device. Or, if you've been listening for a while, there are three ways you can support the show. You can leave a rating or a review on iTunes. Just go to iot-inc.com slash iTunes. It only takes one click to leave a rating, a little bit longer to leave a review. You can share it on social. I'm on LinkedIn, to a lesser extent on Twitter. And of course, you can support the show by buying my book, IoT Inc., or the ICIP Training and Certification Program. That's how I pay the bills. Next week's episode is IoT Security, the Security Development Lifecycle Way with Chris Romeo. I hope you can join me then. I'm your host, Bruce Sinclair. Thank you for listening. Till next week, may your path to IoT business be a safe one. You have been listening to the IoT Inc. Business Show. 